Yeah, thank you very much. So, so I actually we sort of well set up for this discussion. So let me just check that I do know the participants of this because we don't actually have people physically sitting on chairs. Uh, and uh, so the discussion is about realistic expectations for polariton and atom lattices. Uh, and on the panel, we have Andrew, who's just been speaking, Tillman, who's just been speaking, uh, Jonathan Keeling, uh, who um, has been hosting and is about to speak tomorrow, and Pavlos Nagadakis, of course, talked this morning. Um, so, so what I thought I... Was Pavlos here? Um, is Pavlos here? I'm not sure. Um, I don't see him at the moment. Um, so I think you should continue, and he may join us. Um, and we may have uh, Natalia jump in anyway. <laughs> I was going to say, so, so, so that, that, that uh, I'll, I'll consider Natalia a proxy, actually, if I wanted to ask questions of Pablos. Um, uh, but actually, what I did want to do was, was probably to just reformat this a little bit. Um, and although I know that everybody, well, except for Jonathan, has spoken, Jonathan will speak tomorrow, um, would perhaps like to give, uh, you know, a two or three minutes warm up uh, just verbally on, you know, on, on the question of realism. Um, and I, uh, we heard some of that, I think, for Andrew. So, I mean, I, I, Andrew, you, you might want to summarize it again in a moment. But can I sort of uh, go in the other direction? I was going to ask Pavlos, but maybe Jonathan would like to say something about uh, his view of the polariton systems. Um, I, I, I can do that. I, I mean, I, I guess when I speak tomorrow, I'm actually going to be talking in terms of um, experiments with cold atoms in cavities, right. and um, what? Well, um, I think one reason for that is I think there are reasons to believe there are things at least we we know how to do or how to get there, get to them more easily in the atomic system and in the polariton system, and that's to get into any regime where you think there could be any significant quantum effects in in optimization problems. So in I mean in in polaritons, um, I think this is a great system, but it's a system that, as Natalia very clearly said yesterday, involves coupled classical systems at the moment. And um, I mean, actually, I, I prepared for what I would probably, well, what I would like to say in terms of what are realistic hopes is to first rule out what are completely unrealistic hopes. And the two things I would say are completely unrealistic hopes are solving NP problems in P or in constant time, and any algorithm which is based on a purely commuting set of operators which claims to have a quantum speed up. And um, I think actually with what we've heard about polariton systems, everyone has, has made clear that those are limitations. And so I think what, what we can expect is the best op possibility for the, for the kind of gain-based polariton system or gain-based simulation in general with, with classical optics, with coupled lasers and so on, is better heuristic algorithms, so better prefactors. And better prefactors might be a quite big win if you, if you have something that is still exponential in system size, but it's um, e to the 2n rather than e to the 20n, that hugely changes what kind of problem you can solve. So it's, it's still very worthwhile. Um, on the quantum side, I, I would say, I mean, in terms of put, putting cold atoms in cavities and exploring things, I would say, but actually until very recently, this is just a, a fairly une unexplored area of asking about dissipative quantum systems and whether you can solve optimization problems better than, um, than with other algorithms. I think actually I was, I, I was really liked what Monica said in the end of her talk about Grover Search because I think that does suggest routes where you really might combine a quantum speed up of one part of the process with dissipative state preparation for how do you get to, to, to encode the problem into the state that then starts that algorithm. So, so maybe that's where I should, should stop and hand over to someone else. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a, that, that's a good point. And we might actually want to come back to, uh, uh, as you say, the sort of the mix of systems, non-reciprocal and the like, which I think is an interesting space. Um, so I, I was wondering if the, uh, uh, who, would, would somebody like to follow up from that uh, uh, immediately? So I so said, we don't have Pavlos, and I would have asked him on, on that. So um, uh, let, let me turn over and um, uh, perhaps go and see if Tillman would like to make a comment on the, uh, on, on the quantum side. 
And I should also say while saying this that uh, I, I'm going to keep my eye on the chat. Uh, so uh, I hope at some point to throw this out to the audience and uh, start collecting uh, questions in the chat that people want to put to the panel as a whole or to any individual. Um, so, uh, so let me ask Tom, sorry, I need to probably unmute you. Ah, okay, so, okay, sorry, okay. No, so, I, I didn't realize you were, you were off. Yes, please. Um, uh, what I'm wondering about sometimes is what um, quantum simulators or quantum computers, um, uh, what will they actually be used for? And uh, in particular, there, there was this nice comparison with the Hubbard model and how you do it in, on a quantum uh, computer. Uh, and that maybe at some point they will be kind of at an equal uh, level. Um, but then one is wondering how, uh, what do I do with a quantum computer to uh, get new problems? I mean, will I randomly program my uh, uh, gates? I mean, because in, well, in these analog systems, I, I would argue, well, one can use them uh, to actually stumble into regions where I see unexpected. So where I see, uh, where I get new, new insights. And there I see a big difference, or I, for me it's a bit more clearer in analog systems, how I can um, uh, uh, get a direction uh, into the unexpected. And uh, there I see a big difference. I, I do not really know what, how to resolve it. And in general, I also think that probably these devices, both of them, will be used in a completely different way than we think now. I would actually be totally disappointed if, if that's all what, what we estimate now. I, I would be disappointed. Yeah, right, right, yeah. I mean, that's overlook the most important point. That's a, that's a nice, well, it's, what, what you're saying actually is that one should really be thinking about these devices to do experiments on. And the, the, yes. the, that, uh, that, that they're experimental systems uh, and uh, rather than trying to program them to solve models, I mean, even if you have programmed to solve a model, you should be looking at some characteristic of the model that you couldn't measure otherwise. Um, and, I mean, I always comment actually that, that uh, I suspect, um, you know, the uh, ITC is hiding in some fourth order correlator that nobody knows how to measure an experiment. Right, that, 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 there's, uh, that there's, there's some piece of uh, face space that conventional experiments can't explore very well. Uh, and, and, and maybe one should, as you said, be, be looking for something uh, uh, unexpected. Actually. So I, I think it's sort of an interesting comment. Um, uh, let, let me go to Andrew and see if he wants to amplify on some of the things he said earlier. There's a, a very, actually very clear exposition of the challenges and the numbers. I mean, I'm very uh, pleased to see that. So, um, but, but no, now you can be uh, even more free. <laughs> uh, well, well, so, so thanks for that, Peter. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that I would say that I, I completely agree with what Tillman just said. I would be also disappointed if um, the only things that we could do in the next 10 years with these devices were things that we already knew about. Um, the most exciting thing to be doing in three to five years time is the thing that you don't um, you don't know anything about now. But I think that um, I yeah, so I think that that, that indeed that the analog devices they give you something now where you can go and do things that are beyond um, what we can do on a classical computer and that's perhaps why I think that they're such a nice playground right now. The big question for me is where we sort of go in terms of quantum computing in this um, this so-called NISC era before we have fault-tolerant quantum computing. And the question is kind of, you know, how can we do something interesting in a computational direction with these analog devices 
um, that, is, that goes beyond what we sort of see now. In that sense, actually, I also really liked what, what Monica discussed at the end of her talk, um, this idea of bringing something where we know there is a quantum advantage in, in, in Grover's algorithm, finding a native sort of implementation of it, the question, of course, is, um, you know, um, I guess to understand what the limitations of that are in the analog setting. And Monica was mentioning that you might need error correction to really get the full benefit out of this eventually. Um, I, I actually, I'd be curious to, to get Monica's view on that and the whole discussion, actually. I, I well, OK, so let, let's let, well, let, let, let's bring Monica in at that point. And so, Monica, if I, if I unmute you, maybe you'd like to comment there. Uh, let me just... Um, Mute. Sure, yeah, um, thanks for bringing me in. So um, I suppose, yeah, what I can comment on is that I, I find this example um, of a, you know, a specific algorithm where I have a natural encoding of the problem, I find it useful because it really then gives us a way to, with, with a concrete example, ask about what the um, physical limitations are going to be, right? Um, and so, for example, actually, it gives you the opportunity to think about not only um, how does the complexity of the problem scale in terms of number of queries to some oracle, but also physically, how, do, how long does each query take? And is there something that enforces the hardness of the problem in the fact that um, as one enters a hard regime, the queries take longer and longer times, for example. Um, so, um, but it also then allows you to have a really concrete model for what the errors will be in a particular physical implementation. Um, and, and so that's, you know, allowed us to not too surprisingly to see, okay, so one could do this, um, um, at some modest system sizes, but eventually there's a chance that an atom will decay and, um, not surprisingly that will limit the performance. Um, but at least then we have this something to play with and think about, well, given that that's the form of the error, is there a way to correct for it or to make it more robust? And I don't have the answers to that yet. Um, but I think, I almost think you really need to, to build the thing and start to play with it to actually ask, you know, for realistic error models, um, how could you perhaps in an efficient way correct for them, right? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that, that's interesting. Well, by the way, I, mean, I, I think that's already the case, in fact, with uh, so-called quantum computers in the sense that you get the most out of them, uh, you know, by actually understanding how the devices really work and make and make use of non-linearities and noise to be able to uh, to do this. So that that's at least that's what I hear from colleagues who actually try and program IBM machines, right? That you can uh, go in there and do that, but actually it's not that there there are, there are aspects of that that, you, that you'd like to like to learn. Um, so so thanks very much. Um, I, I, actually, I, I see a comment actually from David that I would like to do. David said he'd be very keen on hearing from Natalia Berloff right now. So Natalia, you. You launched us uh, yesterday morning with a really lovely talk. Uh, okay. I'd like to. Uh, oh, no, did I actually succeed in unmuting yeah, you? You unmuted me at some point, yes. Yeah. So, so Natalia, please go ahead. Uh, I think I already split my, my brain yesterday <laughs> panel session. Um, I don't know. You know. You know. For me. Um, you know, maybe I will be somewhat orthogonal, uh, you know, to everything. For me, thinking about the physical system and how it can work as, um, you know, an analog device leads to some um, algorithms, right? Physics-inspired algorithms that you can try and you can incorporate how you would think the physical system should work to, pr uh, to create the classical, new classical algorithms you know to run on your computer and then think you know that's what i need for my classical algorithm to perform and uh, can i actually implement that in a physical system so i think the future uh, at least the nearest future is um, after some kind of hybrid platform when you uh, use the motivation that comes from the physical system to build the new algorithms and you run them on the classical <laughs> Computer, but then you address probably the physical system to do something faster than the classical computer cannot do, you know, just to, to address the bottleneck, you know, to address some very small, um, upper, uh, you know, subset of the operation that actually allows, you know, the, uh, allows you to speed up the, the um, you know, and, you know, 
to have some um, algorithms, to have some computation that, you know, faster than everything that anyone uh, has thought before. At least in the nearest future, I think that's what, um, what we can try to do. Um, okay. Not using no, I mean, I polariton, or tonic lattices, or anything platform that just suddenly miraculously produces, you know, the best result we've ever hoped for. This is the hybrid. It should be hybrid. We can delegate some very small task to these platforms, and I think that's where we should. Um, mm -hmm. Good. That's it. I mean, I actually have a question, which is, I think, probably best answered by you two, which is. Um, comment that, that uh, as physicists, we're obsessed by Hamiltonians. Uh, actually, everything that we're dealing with here is a dynamical system. It's not a Hamiltonian. And if we phrase all of our problems as minimizing something, you end up with a style of solution, which is particularly there. Um, and in other fields, one's seen that, uh, for example, with uh, what, what are called to, today neural networks. Because, you, because neural networks have been phrased uh, as a minimization problem, um, they've actually become very ugly and very clumsy and very difficult, right? Uh, you know, they're nowhere near as good as a real neural network, and a real neural network typically operates as a dynamical system. And dynamical systems have more space, actually. And it seems to me that actually uh, your Polariton system is, a, uh, is, is a actually really, to a certain extent, is a Kuramoto model. Yes. Right? Uh, and Kuramoto models have... Uh, a lot more richness than just actually uh, being able to be minimized in certain circumstances. They can be chaotic, they can be dynamic. Uh, you know, so you know, would you ever want to use it in those modes? Oh, unfortunately, actually, if, um, if it were a Kuramoto model, that would be good. <laughs> because Kuramoto model, at least, it finds the minimum of, um, of something. Right. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, I, I don't know, yes, it's, um, it acts as, uh, in, as a solid, um, as the coupled oscillatory system, uh, you know, it, it exhibits uh, oscillations even when you try, you know, to force it to find, you know, a fixed point. And I think um, it would be interesting to find a suitable application for that. But yeah. so far, you know, Kuramoto systems are very well understood. You know, these generalized Kuramoto systems are very, very, very well understood. And since the Plariton system starts behaving as a Kuramoto system, or Kuramoto system with a phase lag, let me put it like, or Stuart Landau networks, that's how it behaves, right? So what new do we have in polariton systems that we don't have, um, you know, in um, optoelectronic systems or anything else that uh, gives us Stuart Landau networks? Because again, the problem is that the quantum effects come, as, as you said, right, uh, Peter, you know, the quantum effects come during the condensation, but once we have boson to condensate, the system behaves classically and we have these coupled oscillators. So it would be extremely interesting to find some application when indeed having this um, oscillatory networks uh, produce something that we haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. but, you know, okay. I have. Yeah, no, I, I mean, have, as I say, it's sort of it's sort of interesting, as I say. But but that, 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 I'd like to talk to you more about that. Um, I wanted to turn over to other people actually. So Jonathan wanted to make a comment. So please. Yeah. Um. So so in particularly in, in response to this question about the limitations of thinking about things as energy minimization. I, I guess not, not everything here we, we've heard is, has fallen into that category. And I think there are so, sort of three or to three and a half categories of, of how we've been approaching problems in this, this space. Um, and what one is um, quantum simulation, which either means you realize a Hamiltonian and you want to find its ground state or you realize a Hamiltonian and you want to find its dynamics. One is gate-based quantum computation, which really isn't about a Hamiltonian, but is about a sequence of unitaries. And then there is this third thing, which um, people have come out from slightly different routes. And I think one route which brought a lot of people in was um, um, Yoshi Yamamoto's ideas of the Ising machine and gain-based optimization. 
And I think what, what's notably different there and why I say there's three and a half things is that that really is a very classical computation scheme. And I think that this does leave a, a question which I'm certainly interested in, I think others probably are, which is, is there a quantum gain-based optimization paradigm that is not gate-based computation and is not quantum simulation? Um, and I, I'm not quite sure if there is. Um, we, we know what the classical gain-based approach can do, but certainly in the Plariton context, it's hard to see how you push it into the um, limit where quantum effects become significant. But these kind of cold atom and cavity setups that Monica spoke about and um, I'll talk about and Benjamin will talk about tomorrow, um, those all seem to have roots to get towards something that might do that, although I'm not quite sure we know what it would be. Okay, no, that's, uh, no thanks. I mean, actually, that's a very clarifying comment, so, so I was uh, oversimplifying. I see, t I see Tillman has his hand up, uh, and so I'd like to hand over to him, and then uh, David Snoke has a follow-up question, so we'll go to David after that. Tillman, please. Uh, oh, sorry, you seem to be muted. Uh, apologies. Ah, okay. Sorry about that. You, I didn't. Um, uh, um, <laughs> um, when you compare uh, with other systems like neural networks, um, I always find it puzzling that kind of quantum computing works in a kind of opposite direction uh, to other computing, kind of neural networks in the sense that the neural networks are often just black boxes, which for some reason solve some problems. We don't even really understand why they solve them. And in a quantum computer, we try um, to have full control, readout, and uh, manipulation of every single uh, qubit entity. So it I mean, the ultimate control that you can have over a system, that is basically a quantum computer, it's ultimate engineerable machine. And um, there one wonders, of course, whether that is an efficient way to solve problems. It seems to me no, but um, I cannot tell you why exactly. But I, I find it puzzling that it goes in, in such that's, different directions. That's an interesting comment. I mean, <clears throat> I think that's very much in parallel with what Jonathan was saying about, is there a gain-based quantum computer? In some sense, something which adjusts its weights as it moves on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good. So let, let, let's uh, th thank you very much. That's a nice comment. Um, so uh, David, David Snow. Um, yeah, okay. Um, yes, I have a question that sort of starts out as a very practical question and then maybe gets into some more uh, general stuff. <clears throat> so the, the practical question just is, uh, how important is it that we uh, try to make a polariton lattice with one polariton per site? Um, uh, Paulus uh, talked about this a little bit uh, this morning, but he's working on that. And um, uh, so, you know, when I think about, you know, these different systems, uh, in polaritons, <clears throat> it's really hard to do to get just one polariton per site. Uh, in atoms, you know, we're, they're doing it. <clears throat> and um, it kind of gets at what, what makes for good bits. So in the system that uh, Natalia was talking about yesterday, uh, the bit is essentially the parity of a wave function of a condensate in some trap. Uh, and that is your bit, you know, is it is a plus or minus parity. And you control the couplings between all those condensates then. Uh, and in you know a lot of the lattice models that people have, you're talking about a single atom as the bit, and is it there or is it not there, or is it in one state or is it in another state? So I guess there's sort of two questions for the panel in general. So one is, um, you know, what do we gain? I mean, so should we be fighting with polaritons to try to get you know single polariton per site, or should we say, hey, we can make a thousand condensates all coupled to each other? you know, that helps us do something completely different and it's better, you know, or it's complementary. Uh, or should we say, well, you know, the holy grail is to get one polariton per lattice site. Uh, and I guess the second question sort of related is, 
is there fundamentally a different type of information stored in those two different types of, uh, of lattices uh, or networks uh, when you think about having single atoms or condensates with a binary choice of a parity for their wave function? Uh, nice question. Um, anybody like to take that one? I don't know. I, I think, I think um, the challenge is in couplings. You, you, you don't want to be limited by the next neighbor interactions. So even if you have just a single, single polariton per lattice site, um, there are many systems when you have a single something and then it just next neighbor. Uh, okay, but if, I could, if I could make a polariton lattice, which had a thousand or 10,000 condensates, and I could you know, dial up interaction between point A and point B and control all those interactions between every one of those sites in some way. Long, long range. Right? Would that be good also? Or is it kind of like, no, we really need to have a single polariton as our quantum object? No, I think if, if you can have um, 100 by 100 and you can couple everything with everything, that would allow you to, and then you have the mechanism for the system to, uh, to find the minimum of some functional that would be an, an amazing amazing thing because no one no one has achieved it i mean we hear about the coherent ising machine but it's not the the minimum that they truly find so i, I think the the things that needs to be established as the principle why would system find its minimum the minimum the global minimum of some functional whatever it is and then to have the couplings that go beyond the just nearest neighbors. And that would be uh, complexity sufficient enough, you know, that would, um, and it, you do it fast, you do it faster than you would find this minimum uh, by classical simulations. Mm -hmm. yeah, just no. to, to, to add something there, um, I mean, I, I think it's a difficult question to answer because it, it depends why you want to do this. If you want to build a device purely for the purpose of optimization, as, as Natalia said, this doesn't matter. If you want to build a device where you can say there is some quantum effect operating, um, but it's not something that's due to couple classical fields, mm -hmm. then, um, well, then, then firstly, yes, you do need to go into a regime with smaller numbers of platons, but also that's not, that's not enough in that a coherent state with an average population of one is still quite a classical object. What you really need is to have strong enough nonlinearities that you're able to see. Well, the, the, the crucial point is that you have parts of your operation which rely on non commuting operators. And you really don't see that until your nonlinearities get very strong. Mm. But, but I think the problem with that actually as an answer is you can go to all of the effort to do that. But we don't actually know that there is a quantum speed up of this kind of gain based optimization. So what you then end up trying to do is to reproduce cold atom experiments about simulating the Hubbard model, which is definitely a great goal, but it's probably not going to tell you something very new. Hmm. Well, yes, but it may be able to tell you that, that you've done it right. I think that, they, that what, 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 do, what do you mean, uh, Jonathan? With cold atoms, can you do this uh, long range interactions in, you know, and control them? In no, no, so I guess, well, so yes and no. I mean, um, from Monica's talk, um, you can have Rydberg interactions which have a long power law tail. Um, yeah. And you can have cavity mediated interactions which could really be very long range. I'll talk about a, a specific form of long range cavity mediated interaction tomorrow which is, is, is fully all to all and has a complex structure, but is not tunable. So, right, right. You can also, in the near Davidson experiment, you also can have long range interactions, but what you would like to have, you, you want to have, uh, you, you want to control the pairwise interactions and you want to change them independent on the rest of the system. And I don't yeah. think it, you know. Well, I think there is um, this, this um, kind of um, vernier gradient system that Monica talked about is something that can do something toward that. You can say that I want the things which are this far apart in energy level and because the line whips are so narrow there is an opportunity to to address that. Um, I think what I wonder there is the practicality of how many separate things you can address. At, at what point 
um, do you have a problem about how many AOMs you want in your system to be able to keep switching or to, to simultaneously have lots of different connectivities? I mean, the, the, the other thing that we... Yes, Sorry. Let me come in. So, I, I mean, from a, from a cold atmosphere point of view, I mean, the other thing that you can do is you can find ways of rewriting all of these long-range interactions into more local gauge fields. And this is, for example, the theoretical proposal of, of, of Hauke, Lechner, and Zoller to, um, to come up with an architecture for Rupert atoms where you only need local interactions in order to implement your minimization problem, which has arbitrary long-range couplings. So there are ways, if you're interested in the minimization space and principle of doing these things also with a more restricted um, collection of, of couplings. Um, their version does involve the multi-body interactions locally, but that's also something that you can find ways to, to implement. So, so there are ways of getting around that. I mean, I, I guess I would go back to the original question as sort of, you know, should you be, you know, trying to go to the sort of single polarity level? and answer it sort of from this, this point of view that um, as a cold atoms person, I've always asked, could you go into a strongly interacting regime for polaritons that wouldn't be modeled, uh, wouldn't be modeled semi-classically? I guess I would be most interested if you could do that in some regime that was hard to realize with cold atoms. And maybe it is this combination of a strongly interacting system with a certain type of dissipation and with certain types of long range couplings. And I think it would be interesting if that was the native configuration because it might, not necessarily because it might help us solve a minimization problem better, but because it might uncover new physics. And I would appeal again to what the Tillman said before, the most interesting thing if you've got really a new system that has new intrinsic properties is that you might discover something that you weren't thinking about at the beginning. So. That, that, that's, a, that, that's a good question. Uh, great. So, um, well, we're getting up on an hour, so I think we should uh, think about how to uh, close. I just want to check that there aren't any more questions from the audience. I don't, uh, I don't see anything in the chat. And I don't see any hands up, but I encourage a uh, stop there. Um, now maybe let's just go around the panel again and, and ask people uh, if they've got one last comment. And so, so, so Tillman, uh, oh, oh, Mo Monica's got a hand up. So let me, Monica, please, uh, I need to unmute you, I think. I just wanted to briefly comment because uh, Jonathan mentioned our experiments in terms of the tunability of the long range interactions. So the first quick comment is no, you don't need an extra AOM to add in um, a different distance of interactions. It's actually a single device that generates some waveform that, that programs the structure of the interactions. But I, I, the simplest thing one gets is something that isn't arbitrary JIJ couplings, right? There's a translation invariant. So one still needs to break that. And that, but there, of course, are approaches involving local addressing, which isn't being used at all yet, or hopefully you'll hear more about multi-mode cavities and, um, you know, tomorrow, I think. And so I would say there is quite an exciting opportunity for programming the structure of the interactions in the cavity systems. Um, but certainly it's not an arbitrary JIJ coupling yet. Um, but I, I think that's, there's the direction to do that. So. But can you um, can, can can you do like almost all the nearest neighbors, but then um, just few uh, kind of Möbius Möbius letter with just a few rewired edge, edges, let's say you know just flipping some of the edges. Is it a possibility? I think I think so. Yeah. So um, I would think that by changing from the set setting of an ordered array um, in terms of the spatial configurations to a more disordered spatial structure while still having, and then combining that with the control over the distance dependence of the interactions, I think one might be able to do what you've described. But I would love to understand better, maybe we can talk offline, what, what exactly you have in mind. So, yeah. It's just interesting if you, if you can have the connections that actually give you the graph, which, is, uh, which has sufficient complexity, that's, that's the... Uh, the point because many of the graphs that people you know try their systems on they simply you know very easy to find the minimum it just the yeah nature. exactly and so my instinct is that one can quickly add complexity by adding disorder um in the site positions but that would be really important and interesting to investigate further yeah yeah 
Thank you. Um, so let's see. So let, let me just go, go around. So to uh, any last um, last comments, so Tillman. Um, maybe maybe one uh, uh, comment on uh, following up that kind of well, the key point both in quantum computing, quantum simulation is this enormous control that we have over uh, the entities. I mean, and, and a question I think that one can ask uh, with these systems is also how could nature have looked like? I mean, only the kind of the laws of quantum mechanics are still there and can I get very different structures in a way? And if some scalings were different or something, can, can I get something else than what I'm used to, to see? Still quantum mechanics being um, or the, 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 the theory to follow or the, the, the laws to follow. No, no, thanks very much. Um, so, Jonathan, last comment. Um, I, I actually, I'm not sure if there's anything I want to add to, to what, what I've already said, so I think I'll, I'll just leave it there. Right. Then, uh, Andrew. Um, yes, yeah, so maybe I would just add that, you know, as a theorist, what's really nice is seeing all of the experimental developments and seeing the, the new systems being built up with polaritons and the new ingredients that are coming there the new ingredients and ways to control things that people are developing in AMO systems. Um, because, you know, as we've sort of seen and, you know, particularly, you know, um, through analog quantum simulation, uh, if you have new possibilities to do, to do things natively in these experiments, they often give you opportunities either to solve problems beyond physics or to look at interesting new physics. So the exciting thing is going to be to see the new levels of control that are developed in the experiments and both of these types of, of directions um, and then to explore what we can do with those native properties. That, that sounds like a sort of a, a nice optimistic close actually to the session today. So. I have a, I have a, yes, David, you want to, yeah. Um, yeah. So I would say this in terms of the, the polariton. So if you think about BECs in general, uh, if we have a homogeneous system, we already know the answer to how long it takes for BEC to thermalize and become a condensate in its ground state. I mean, that's a solved problem from the last 20 years. Uh, and it's you know, basically linear with the size of the system. Um, so then the question, which is not an answered question, is if you have a complex topology with some kind of network, and then the condensate has to find the ground state of that system, uh, rather than something simple and homogeneous, what's the time scale for that? Um, and we don't know the answer to that. And so one might argue on first principles, it has to be, uh, you know, very bad at doing that because it's essentially a classical system. Or one might argue there's some kind of quantum speed up because a Bose condensate does have quantum mechanics going on. Um, so I think that's an open question. Uh, the question I have is actually, uh, have people looked at that same kind of question then with these uh, single atom lattices in terms of thermalization time. So, you know, like how long does it take to reach the ground state uh, of that system? Is that a, is that a solved problem uh, for these single atom lattice uh, things and cold atoms? Well, somebody want to comment about many body localization. I think that's probably <laughs> going to bring that in. Yeah. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps you could comment on it, Peter. Um, or... No, 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 no. That's good. But okay, yeah, so there's, there's been a lot of work done in the last years on, um, on disordered systems and, um, and in a variety of different types of non ergodic systems, and especially when you add disorder and you get many body localization in the presence of, um, presence of interactions. This is a problem, of course, that goes back um, a very, very long way and has been a theoretical challenge. And it's something that a variety of people in experiments are starting to try to address what happens. The dynamics have been addressed recently. You're saying the time scale for these things has, has been solved. Um, I wouldn't say it's a solved problem, but it's one that we it's a good example of a problem that we have a great deal of difficulty solving theoretically. We are in the You are frozen, but maybe I have frozen. I'm not sure. Oh, um, can you still hear me? 
So in 1D, we know a lot more than we do in higher dimensions. In higher dimensions, some of the best indications that we have are starting to come from experiments. For example, with atoms and quantum gas microscopes, there were experiments by Emmanuel Bloch and many things that, that you know, other people are starting to develop. Um, and there's actually a good chance that quantum simulators with cold atoms can tell us things that we don't have a proper understanding of theoretically. But what's uh, the answer? I mean, is the answer that it's linear with system size or um, some power law? Or? Well, normally, actually, the, the time it takes for information to spread becomes becomes logarithmic. But it's a complicated thing because it depends on the it depends strongly on the details of the system, on the, the types of interactions, the types of disorder. And so you get different answers depending on the, the, the details. Yeah. Sorry about that. I just uh, dropped out, but um, uh, you seem to be coping. Um, okay, so I'm going to call last, last, last orders, actually. Um, anyone here? Is there anything on the chat? I don't see anything further. Uh, so I suggest actually this is probably a uh, uh, good time to uh, take a break for the day um, and uh, thank everybody on the panel and thank everybody for a fabulous set of talks actually that, that came and, and all of the contributions we have. It's been uh, really enlightening.